Okay, I'm going to get started. Uh, we got a we got a busy session here. There's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of moving around uh, to do different presentations. So I'm going to get started. Uh, my name is Jeff Applewhite. I'm a technical marketing engineer at NetApp, and uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, glad to see you turn out and uh, see the interest in uh, use cases here. This is exciting for me because this is where we close the loop. And uh, you've heard us talk about our technology and our integrations uh, and our value for the cloud, but now we get to hear about it from our customers. So I'm very excited to hear that. I work with the guys who do development uh, day in and day out. I see them in Scrum. I hear them you know, in the development process. So it's exciting for me to, to hear how customers are using it. So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, uh, briefly, I'll just talk about our value. Um, I came from operations uh, for 10 years. Um, I, I was a NetApp customer at two different hosting companies, um, hosting you know ringtones for uh, you know large uh, cellular providers, 60 million subscribers. Um, so I know what data can do, and I'll tell you, data is foundational. So your your uptime will never exceed your data. Obviously, if you have an application, you have a network, you have no data, you have no application, you have no cloud. So that's I think what really, if I had to sum it up, that is our primary value add is that the you know uh, data is provided by systems, but systems are operated by people. And NetApp, uh, our expertise, what we do is to help you run those systems, maintain availability, and keep those systems up. So that really, to me, is our core value uh, that I wanted to speak to. I want to move along pretty quickly because, as I said, we've got a lot of speakers today here. Uh, we are going to uh, first uh, talk about, uh, just reference quickly, BV BBVA that spoke uh, earlier today uh, is a NetApp customer. They're using Cinder drivers. Uh, they are deployed on us, so uh, they, they couldn't go into the details of their deployment during the uh, keynote, but uh, they are an OpenStack customer. Uh, and I also want to talk to uh, Russell Sim from University of Melbourne, who's going to actually take us through the, the deep, dirty, down details of, uh, of their deployment. And it's not sanitized. There's going to be a lot of uh, real world you know, examples of things that uh, they've encountered, lessons learned along the way. And this is going back all the way to Diablo, so uh, to give you some context. Uh, we're going to also talk about our uh, internal deployments uh, with what we call customer zero and one, which is our internal uh, IT group and our engineering. Uh, Jeff Whitaker is going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about uh, some potential uh, integrations around SAP. One of the things we also heard in keynotes this morning is the need to have all of our apps enabled for OpenStack, not just the, uh, the primarily cloud-enabled applications. So we're going to talk about that, uh, uh, SUSE and SAP. So with that, let me turn it over to Russell Sim. Thanks. Okay, how's it going? Um, today um, I'm going to talk you through uh, the cloud deployment at the University of Melbourne and how we um, how we set up our OpenStack and how NetApp uh, came to save our asses when our storage went bad. <laughs> so, um, to give you a bit of background, Nectar is a um, government-funded program, part of which was to provide an e-research platform for all of Australian researchers. Um, we, uh, the Melbourne node was funded under this program. It was the first node that was deployed um, in 2012 as part of this platform. Um, as a result, we learned a lot of lessons early on and we were tasked with teaching um, everyone else who joined up. We initially started with one um, data center only because cells, as you would know, still hasn't, well, hasn't been really fully adopted. It's getting along, but it's, come, it's taking a little while. Um, yeah, so our first, our first storage setup was essentially um, a whole lot of nodes all mounting um, virtual machine disk images over NFS. Um, this, was, uh, this was mostly done to provide two things. One was we needed it for live migration, I believe, to work at the time. We also needed it to um, allow us to provide a high level of assurance to customers. So if anything went bad, we could recover data. Um, this is especially important in a research environment where people aren't used to dealing with clouds, and so they're not fully prepared for the case where their machine goes down and they, they might, uh, yeah, things aren't as they seemed. Um, this storage that we had was hosted on university shared storage because we weren't under the um, funding agreement allowed to buy storage directly ourselves, so it was an in-kind contribution from the university. As a result, um, these are lovely IO weight graphs, so higher is worse. Um, this is one of the, the pitfalls, I guess, of using a shared system where you don't really have a good SLA and you also have no control over how other people use this system. Um, as a result of these huge wait times, we were getting like lots of customer, um, angry customers coming back at us and we were, weren't looking the best. So we put a case together to get extra funding to allow us to um, deploy some storage infrastructure. Um, NetApp, NetApp was the provider that came to the party. They uh, did our, their initial, an initial deployment for us with 
uh, each of our data centers having two fast controllers um, with some storage off of that. These controllers exported the same NFS share that we were using before, but we also expanded our platform of services that we offered to include um, volume storage through Cinder. This was very early on in the um, Cinder, I guess, kind of adoption phase for, for NetApp. Um, we were running the, the very early on tap software. We were also running a very early um, version of their driver. So there were a few little hiccups along the way, but we managed to get really, really good customer support, including access to the developers to get um, quick turnarounds on fixes before we move this system in pr into production. Um, we needed a, a small adder to migrate all the VMs across, but uh, that was much better than the, the pain that everyone had been tolerating up to that point. Um, so this was last year. This year, we've um, we received another funding grant which came through, which was uh, the data which was meant to be provided at the start of the project. It trickled on in a bit later. But when it's finally arrived, um, unsurprisingly, we went back and um, expanded the existing NetApp solution that we had at each of our data centers. Along with expanding the, the hardware, we also expanded the services that we decided to offer. So um, originally, we had our NFS shared storage for the VM images. We had our iSCSI volumes that we were using for um, volume storage. We also started to offer off um, NFS shares. This was because um, under, this, under this new funding arrangement, we had to provide services to allow researchers to, um, I guess, kind of uh, develop data sets of national importance. So um, these data sets were being worked on. They might have been hosted on the cloud infrastructure. They might have been hosted on HPC in, you know, infrastructure somewhere else in the university. So we needed a diverse kind of flexible solution. We ended up um, just using the standard vServer configurations and stuff that come with the NetApp FAS solution. And, um, we did some, uh, did some more complicated things with it, including setting up proper backup um, routines as well as even off-site replication to our second data center so that um, in the case of any kind of catastrophic failure, we would have some assurances that these like, nationally important data sets weren't lost. Um, some of these data sets possibly would have been even the primary data source, so you have no way of recovering that. So we had a lot of, um, a lot of reason to be, I guess, kind of careful. Um, Along with, along with these, um, this kind of data sets that were being developed, we also had to target data sets that basically were developed. So we needed a, a platform which would allow us to archive large data sets um, as well as provide, I guess, kind of a, um, a tool to, for them to provide these data sets to other people. Swift um, uh, was provided for that solution. So Swift allows customers to come in and access stuff through HTTP. There's a lot of um, access control that the users can leverage to, I guess, uh, mediate access. Um, this uh, was the architecture that was uh, adopted uh, by us and uh, given to us by um, NetApp and Aptera. Um, we basically have three of these E55, um, these E-series controllers in each of our data centers. And they're set up such that there's um, two host VMs in front of them that are iSCSI mounting the, the data and then um, exporting that out through Swift. And we have a, a like a, a production um, FI load balancer in front of that to um, allow redundancy as well as resiliency. One thing that is interesting is that we're using, instead of the standard way you'd do Swift with three replicas, we've got a kind of a hybrid model where we're using RAID DP, um, which is double parity. So it's uh, similar to RAID 6, but better. And there's, um, so that, that provides us with a, an extra replica at each of our sites. And we also have Swift maintaining one replica at each site. So um, I guess that gives us basically four copies, which is really quite important, as I said before, because there's a, a lot of, um, I guess, kind of, there's a lot of, we have to put a lot of pressure on researchers to give their data up. They're very defensive. They're worried about it. They don't want to lose it. So giving these kind of levels of assurances is quite important, especially if the data set, say, can't be recreated at all. Um, yeah, so that, that, that brings us to our current configuration. Um, and yeah, we're much happier these days. Um, I guess I'd like to go summarize with a few of the experience that we've had. So um, we got heaps of support initially early on with the Cinder driver. It was just fantastic to see um, such enthusiasm for us adopting someone else's technologies. Um, we've, it, our local NetApp providers have given us super fast spares replacements as well, which is quite surprising well, and kind of relieving. Um, we even investigated using the Manila driver to do NFS um, access control, but we haven't um, had we didn't have time within the deadlines that we um, set for ourselves to actually 
deploy it. Um, but we, when we were investigating this as a possibility, um, we got really quick access to the, um, the Manila developers as well because that was very early on in Manila development times and it was, um, hadn't really been, it wasn't even um, incubated at that point. So um, that was fantastic to, to see them so excited about us considering their software again. Um, we have, since moving over to this NetApp solution, we haven't had any outages, even when we changed um, to our alternate infrastructure, which um, included a change of switch and things like that. So we went from no switch to a couple of switches with HA. So uh, that's been just fantastic. Um, and we've had no customer uh, impacting load issues since then. But, but I guess that's partly because we can control how the aggregates, I guess, and the load is managed on the, the device itself, which is something we had no control over before, which I guess is why you should just, you know, uh, well, there's advantages to having your own storage. Um, in the future, I think that uh, Melbourne University will probably be looking quite, quite closely at trying to move towards a Manila-style solution so that it's a self-service model. We have two operators who are in the room, Marcus and Devendran, Devendra. Damn it. Um, yeah, so those two guys, um, uh, uh, um, yeah, they, um, I, I don't know, I just lost my train of thought then. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna investigate, sorry, going to that. We don't have enough um, operators to support, um, to support basically manually provisioning NFS forever. So we're going to go towards a more self-service model. Um, I'd like to quickly thank NetApp, um, Aptera, and I guess Southern Cross um, Compute Systems for their support on doing this um, uplift program to, to enhance our data storage. And uh, yeah. Is that? We're going to have a QA session. We have time for questions uh, at, at the end. So. Me? Is that better? Okay. So, uh, so my name is Jeff Fordaker. I'm in the Cloud Solutions Group uh, with NetApp. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the engineering deployment here, and then uh, then I'll pass on to Colin as we uh, as we move forward. So, uh, did you have a pointer, or did you just use this? Yeah. Just, okay. So, just to talk a little bit about where we are, uh, you know, NetApp is a as a engineering uh, comp you know as the engineering company. You know, we've got an infrastructure where we've got a lot of shared uh, environments. We've got nine different uh, R&D labs uh, throughout the company, as well as uh, covering about a 5,500 uh, engineering user base. So a pretty large scale, you know, growing uh, as, as, we, uh, as we move forward. And, and we really are kind of customer zero. As Jeff had mentioned, there's customer zero, customer one uh, concept within NetApp where, you know, customer zero is the engineering development side of uh, the piece where we take some of the early, you know, the first things that, that NetApp comes out with new technologies, new capabilities. You know, we take that in and do an implementation with that. And then, uh, and really drive an innovation. One of the big things is really just so we can kind of pass some of the information. It's always good to have a, a new technology go through kind of the internal process before it goes out to you guys and, and uh, uh, do the next step. So from a, uh, the concept of a global engineering cloud, so from a cloud pr uh, environment, um, you know, we provide solutions. You know, one thing that we've been de developing over the last couple of years is kind of as we move to uh, kind of the ideal solution, you know, we've gone and we've, we've basically uh, virtualized about 98% of our infrastructure. So really giving us a good foundation for building uh, an environment. And to where we've actually moved today to the, the cloud service environment where, you know, this is a, a structure that's a self-service uh, cloud environment. Uh, we have uh, multi-hypervisor capabilities, so we do VMware and Hyper-V and, and Red Hat uh, in those environments. Uh, as I said, 98% virtualized, uh, three-rack uh, infrastructure uh, that's a, a NetApp environment called FlexPod. And we can support up to 10,000 uh, VM deployments uh, within that infrastructure. So, you know, it's a 5,500 uh, engineering environment. You know, it's scalable to a certain point, but, you know, we definitely have to plan for growth uh, beyond that. You know, so as we're moving forward, uh, you know, we're, we're taking that next step of going from self-service portal in a specific environment to an OpenStack-based environment where not only is it self-service, but it, it provides us as, a, as an infrastructure component 
uh, more of a REST API based access. You know, really the, the, from an OpenStack piece, it provides us much more control, much more capabilities. And when we go beyond this 10,000 environment and we stack more uh, components to that, now we don't have to worry about uh, uh, the self-service port. And, uh, I should say the self-service piece of this was developed internally. So we did all this ourselves, you know, but as you scale and grow beyond that, you know, uh, the OpenStack piece allowed us to uh, uh, use the APIs and grow in a much uh, uh, more seamless uh, path. Uh, and then really, you know, what we're doing here is tying this together, taking the OpenStack piece, um, converging it, you know, adding more hypervisors as we go on. You know, our, our goal is to be uh, uh, kind of agnostic, you know, have a lot of different uh, flexibility in which direction we go. You know, do we need to add KVM into that environment? Do we know what, what directions? Uh, um, we have flexibility with OpenStack underneath us, and it doesn't actually change the, uh, the self-service component. And from the NetApp side of things, we take a lot of uh, features into this. I mean, it, as you're building out infrastructure and, you know, in the size of this deployment, you know, one of the biggest concerns is cost. You know, how much does it cost per user to deploy? Uh, so we take, you know, just from the capabilities within the storage environment, we do thin provisioning. Uh, we do copy offloads, kind of minimizing our, our uh, uh, impact to the actual cluster. And then uh, deduplication, so minimizing, again, the footprint of the environment, doing thin provisioning and um, flex balls is a path to doing that. So from a savings perspective, you know, just going to that first step, you know, we've saved about 66% of our actual footprint. So, you know, so we're, we're you know, over-utilizing our capacity by a considerable amount. And as we go to OpenStack, one of the key things that, you know, hey, we want to take on a new technology, the key is we did not want to actually lose some of those provisioning pieces. So we still, you know, I, I basically we couldn't go to OpenStack and then raise our actual capital costs uh, by doing so. Um, so, and, and as we did that, you know, one of the key things that we looked at, you know, with, with different uh, hypervisor environments and different uh, deployment environments, you know, we're going to RHEL OSP was kind of the choice that we went down. Uh, we couldn't, you know, we didn't want to build and maintain that ourselves. So, you know, we went with an infrastructure that was already uh, pre-built and had these capabilities be built into it. So uh, I'll pass it on to Colin, talk a little bit about what uh, Red Hat uh, RHEL OSP uh, component of it, and he'll provide some updates on that. Thanks very much. <coughs> Everybody, name's Colin Devine. I'm a technical business partner development manager at Red Hat, been there for a number of years. Uh, what does that mean to you guys? Well, I focus on specifically on a few sort of key partners. I help uh, work their technical issues, go joint solutions, joint marketing, go to market, everything to make uh, us successful with them. Uh, the way I paraphrase it to uh, people I introduce myself with, like you guys, is that when I'm with the uh, marketing folks, I'm the technical guy. When I'm with the technical folks, I'm just the marketing guy. You know, it happens. Uh, I like working with these guys in NetApp, though. They know how to rock. They, who was here at Vegas? Who was at Vegas last week? Anybody? Anybody? It was a great party. I had lots of fun. There's somebody in the back. Anyway, I just want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, OpenStack, a little bit about Red Hat OpenStack platform, what value we have, and, and how we, we work together with uh, with NetApp. So, just a little bit about. I think you probably you probably all get this. I'm probably repeating this to the crowd, but just to summarize real quick, uh, we we know the workloads are changing. We know that, uh, as my our CEO says, this is the biggest change in our industry in in the last 25 years since mainframe went to client server. You know, 80, in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, the move from virtualization or, or even bare metal to cloud workloads is going to be a major disruption point in our industry. There's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. And just like all of you here, uh, Red Hat wants to be on the winning side. So we, we got into this a number of years ago. We see this as a great fit for, for us, the value we add, uh, taking the craziness that is open source and driving it into the enterprise. Uh, let's see the next. So let me just touch on that a little bit. Uh, how Red Hat adds value. So, as you most likely know, again, I'm preaching to the, preaching to the choir here a little bit, but uh, Upstream, of course, releases every six months. Red Hat takes that Upstream uh, craziness, recompiles into something that uh, our users and our uh, partners can use in either Fedora or CentOS, and that's called RDO. That's Red Hat's distribution of OpenStack. Don't tell anybody I told you that. It's a code name, okay, RDO. So, we, we take that, we recompile that, and go out and rock, rock the world with it. Uh, we, after about two months after we release that, again, about two weeks after Upstream, RDO is released, two months, two or three months after that, we 
we test, we QA, we bug fix, we certify, we work with our partners and make sure their solutions are integrated, and then we release our version of Red Hat Enterprise op Linux OpenStack platform. I don't know who named it, forgive me. We call it RHEL OSP for short, but you're not allowed to know that either. Uh, we release that to the world. Uh, we're, of course, released five back in August. That was based on Icehouse. Juno, as we know, we're in that two to three month window. It should be released in December, maybe early January. January. So that's where we're in the cycle we are right now. Uh, again, the value that Red Hat brings is that we, we take the craziness that is upstream, you know, the, the design summit craziness that goes on later this week, and we test it and QA it and we certify it and we put training on it and we have services focused on it and we partner with our fantastic partners and we wrap it in a three-year uh, SLA, delivers value to our customers. So an enterprise can value from, can get benefit from the quickly moving uh, technology but in a way that's consumable to them. That's, that's why Red Hat exists. Take upstream craziness, make it consumable for the enterprise while living and breathing the open source model. How do we work with NetApp? We work with NetApp in a number of ways. We've been working with them for 15 years. They, they know open source, they know how to work in that world, they know how to get their drivers upstream. They've got a number of projects, from Cinder drivers to Manila project. If you don't know about the Manila project, check it out, you should be familiar with that. It's gonna be pretty cool and awesome. It's still in incubation, but it's, it's rocking out pretty well. Uh, we work with them, we've been certified them, clustered data on tap, on tap in seven mode. These guys know how to work in the open source world. Uh, you know, for a you know, traditional storage vendor, they know it better than others. I work with a number of partners out there. I work with partners that, that don't get it. I work with partners that come to us and say, hey, we want to work with you on, on, the, on the neutron networking. And we say, great. They say, we want to take it and fork it. And we said, what are you doing? And then they say, we want to add our own stuff. And we say, we're not sure what you're doing that for. And then we want us to support it. We're like, That's not how this world works. You don't work that way. You work upstream. You add value and you add contributions, you add code, and that's that what gives you uh, authority I in, the, in, the, in the open source world. And then you work with your partners and your customers to drive that into value in that they can consume. That's how you win this, this the open source in, in from the OS where we have experience to the cloud where, where we're all going now. So uh, that's all I have on that. That's next slide. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, I have the pleasure at a late time to tell you a bit about our proof of concept project we had uh, with SAP in the SAP labs in Waldorf. I'm working there as a technical marketing engineer for NetApp with many of my colleagues. So, our goal in Waldorf is to, to uh, help our customers to use all the NetApp features in an enterprise application as, uh, uh, with SAP. So we, we are building technical reports, we are doing the architecture, we are building even solutions and add-ons in order to optimize our infrastructure for SAP customers. A uh, couple of months ago, we realized that, uh, well, both of our companies um, are pretty heavy interested in cloud. SAP is cloud, SAP is uh, OpenStack member, uh, we are a long time OpenStack member and we looked at one of the SAP management tools, management UIs that is called the uh, Landscape Virtualization Manager or as a shortcut LVM so I try to focus on it's not the LVM you might be used in the uh, Linux environment so when, whenever there's an LVM in, our, in my slides it's a Landscape Virtualization Manager. It's a tool from SAP where they built in uh, an environment to manage SAP, to relocate, to clone, to copy. And it's a perfect instrument for us at NetApp and for any hardware vendor to add in infrastructure related additional services like backup like our snapshot and cloning techno technology so that you can avoid to copy 100 uh, gigabyte or more of data uh, via the wire but using a snapshot technology as we uh, uh, give that to as an added value for our infrastructure. So we asked them 
wouldn't it be nice to set up a cloud proof of concept to see how that works together? And SAP asked us, hey, what's about OpenStack? So we are interested in OpenStack and uh, the LVM, now Landscape Virtualization Manager, has a storage API and they asked us, wouldn't it be nice to investigate whether we could not develop an OpenStack API so that SAP calls directly OpenStack code? So that was the challenge and the goals. What we uh, like to achieve with that, so show how, how to deeply integrate in, in a cloud-like environment to show our added values. Also to utilize the LVM and another acronym, the SSC, that is the, our NetApps service, uh, storage services connector. Basically that little middleware that translates SAP's calls, do me a snapshot into uh, our API calls or into OpenStack API calls and then finally set up an OpenStack landscape and show how that works in that environment. Why is that so special? I mean uh, a lot of the talks um, before well, are dealing with standard web type of applications when we talk about SAP. By the way, who knows about SAP as an application or is using SAP as an application? A, a few hands at least. So we are talking about a large scale enterprise business critical applications. So the minimum database size, it's very data centric. It starts maybe with 100 gigabyte of, of data, database and goes up to several terabyte. Um, even the newer form of uh, SAP HANA is an in-memory in database with a persistence of several terabyte on the storage. So, and when we talk about enterprise ready application, uh, it's clear that we don't talk about local disks, but uh, enterprise class storage. So that's the reason why we really good interconnect and uh, have a value. So, how does it start with that OpenStack? So our goal was to use sub LVM as an orchestration on setting up an OpenStack cloud environment. And our goal was to use Manila as a, a shared file system, not only for shared files, because uh, whenever you deal with SAP in an SAP distributed environment or in HANA, they call it scale out, you have to have a shared file system, usually NFS. Um, and also in the, in the last 20 years, NFS as a data store for SAP is very common and has many benefits. Ease of use, ease of maintenance, still highly performant. Uh, all the tools like snapshot cloning could be easily used without any conflicts of open file systems. So the challenge was to set up an open stack environment that fits SAP, that uses Manila as driver, so, and we chose SUSE as, as a partner, it was quite a, a, a good match. Uh, first of all, the guys are sitting in the same partner port as we are, uh, close to SAP, basically at the SAP headquarters. So it was very short communication and we are using their Cloud4 infrastructure to easily set it up to basically, uh, after the network challenges have been settled, uh, getting getting all up and running in, in uh, less than half a day. Um, but basically that was that was a challenge and many things if you I have the challenge to, to, to explain that to you in uh, just four slides. So uh, many things have to be solved like on what type of disks or aggregates do I position my data and lock devices? How do, that, do I distribute it? What is the throughput requirements? Do I use 10, 10 gigabit links, one gigabit links? Um, like how do I design my storage? Um, how do I design my network in order to get that throughput you really need for running an in-memory database and starting up in a reasonable amount of time? So all those parts have influenced our OpenStack design and uh, have influenced our decisions on uh, set up an SAP system. So we have some deviations to, to standard uh, uh, like floating IPs. SAP has a, a, an own uh, 
way of doing virtual IPs and their own mapping. Who of you attended the Manila uh, session, just the previous session here? Okay, so one, one thing to, to remember, one of the Manila parts is uh, you can create a share with Manila, but who mounts it from within the operating system? With sub LVM, LVM is taking care about that. So basically you, have, you can use Manila as it is right now without uh, thinking about who is mounting it because that is part of the uh, SAP concept here. So if you look in a little bit detail, um, so sub LVM um, is basically a SAP centric UI to control the whole infrastructure. So we can start and stop uh, the SAP systems running on Nova, running on, on SUSE here. Um, the storage is provisioned via uh, Manila as shared storage with a data and a lock share, uh, which is the simple case there. You can do it differently, but that is the minimum requirement on shares. Um, and, SAP, and we have developed a little SSC for OpenStack when that helps us when SAP is calling clone me a volume, clone me an SAP database, um, this SSC translates that in OpenStack Manila calls. So basically that single clone call is translated into Manila create snapshot and then Manila uh, access so that basically on the fly um, the clone is created, the snapshot is created, the clone is created, an access is created, and then SS, uh, SSC reports back the names. I've created those share names, and then sub LVM is taking care about the rest. He has the information about the shares. He knows on which system he needs to start it. He mounts it. He starts it up, he does a lot of more things like firewalling, taking care that your copy of your production might not necessarily restart the print shop you have started previously on the real production, something like that. So it's all taken care about, uh, taken care from sub LVM. And it was a nice, nice way through all that part because basically there was one, one little obstacle we have to solve and then always working out of the box um, with these with the Manila uh, stuff we had so far. Of course we have part of that PUC and it's important to notice that there is always the little lab preview. We are in a lab environment. Lab environment means well, a lab environment at SAP with lab code of the uh, um, of the sub LVM and also lab code of our Manila part. So, but it, it gives you a bit of a glimpse how Manila could help to simplify an SAP part, to simplify uh, the management, and it is completely transparent in sub LVM just as another storage, storage driver there. So, lessons learned. Um, sub LVM's provisioning features are valid for OpenStack, so they could be used in an OpenStack environment, um, thus meaning that uh, we can use those enhanced capabilities of clone copy, refresh, just out of the box that are built in an LVM, but with OpenStack storage provided by, by an NetApp uh, cluster data on top. Um, and all the features set uh, from NetApp could be used in an uh, optimized operations. It's important to notice OpenStack's not equal OpenStack. So you have really to take care about what is your network setup, uh, how do you handle Neutron when you deal with virtual IPs that are additional IPs that are bound at runtime within your virtual machine, how to allow access to the Neutron firewall, and so on. So there are many things to, to, to architecture into your OpenStack setup so to get it right so that it works with SAP. And there are future projects that we may focus on, like uh, the sub LVM has also a uh, virtualization API defined, where there could be a good part to include Nova so that uh, sub LVM cannot only clone the storage, but could also create the instance, clone the storage and get all in one shot. 
So that was a, a short uh, introduction of what we've done. It's important to mention at 6.40 at the SUSE booth, there is a more in-depth in technical discussion about that with a, with a little demo or live clips uh, we have about that project. So if you're interested, you're welcome to join that, that session too. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, obviously the, the bars are opening soon. I don't want to keep you, keep you from that uh, too long, but uh, we do have a little bit of time for questions for any of the presenters, for Russell or uh, Byrne or, uh, or Jeff Whitaker. Yes. Trying to keep this informal here. Anybody else? Good questions? Nothing? Everybody want to get to the drinks, huh? <laughs> All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, thank you for your time and your interest. Uh, appreciate it. Have a great summit. Thank you.